Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Suzerain, a new uh, political choose-your-own-adventure role-playing text game, uh, which puts you in the shoes of a fictional country uh, in the 1950s and gives you a lot of challenges and issues to deal with as you attempt to lead your country into a brighter, better future, coming out of a military dictatorship and attempting to bring democracy or clamping down on that democracy and uh, reasserting a, th a form of authoritarianism over your country. There's a lot of different ways you can play. There's a lot of different choices that you have to make in this game. This is a game fundamentally about choices. Uh, in our last episode, we joined the ATO, which was fundamentally NATO in our particular uh, game, and uh, befriended or became closer with uh, the president of the essentially the country that is the United States in this game. Uh, in this episode, we will see some interesting political dynamics uh, evolve as our quest for re-election uh, in the 1950, well, I don't even remember what year it is, like 56 or so campaign. But let's go ahead and jump in. This was taken from my Twitch uh, channel. It was a live stream that I conducted a couple of weeks ago now. So we'll get close to wrapping this up. There's two more episodes, today's episode, and there will be one more episode uh, in this series before we wrap up. So I hope you guys enjoy. Leave your thoughts down below, and I'll turn it back over to my live stream yourself. Election speech at the USPHQ. Oh, boy. Good morning, sir. Morning, Lucian. Lucian sat down in the, in the suite's office chair and pulled a piece of paper from his jacket pocket. I just thought I'd drop off some talking points for your speech today. Much appreciated. Ready to hit the campaign trail again? I'm ready if you are, Mr. President. I'll see you at the rally. Almost forgot. The Archpriest of Dyer couldn't be present today, but wanted to relay a message of support to you and your family. What'd he say? I bless the rains down in Enrichia. Lucian left the room. I finished putting on my tie and reread my notes for the morning speech. A few hours later, I was waiting at the wings of the Nord Auditorium in Enrica. In the audience were several thousand of my conservative supporters. Behind the podiums hung a swordish flag and a giant banner that read, I don't know what the banner read. Why does it matter what I choose here? Yeah, I mean, I feel like four might be the right one, but what are the parties again? Uh, What's the USP stand for again? United Swordland Party? Yeah, okay, that's fair. Tarkin Soul's painting says one on it. Yeah, but I'm not playing to the Tarkin Soul... Well, whatever. Everyone cheered as I walked on stage, though Mayor Curtin Lesty was now a part of the opposition as a member of the NFP. It seemed most of Enrizia was still on my side. Peter gave a short speech introducing me. Then it was my turn. I stepped behind the podium and took a deep breath. Brothers and sisters of the USP. I'm playing to the party, right? So I'm speaking to the party. Three and a the three and a half, the past three and a half years have seen our country tested again and again. Yet Swordland has prevailed under my administration. We are stronger than ever. Yet I stand before you now, ready to pledge myself to God and Swordland yet again. Huh. I'll go with one. With my re-election, I will finish pulling Swordland's economy from the depths of recession. I've begun to fix the disastrous economic decisions of my predecessors. Together we will get the economy. With my re-election, I will finish pulling Swordland's economy from the depths of recession. 
Under my presidency, Swordish citizens have united like never before. That is not true, but it's better than peace and harmony because we definitely don't have harmony. We brought change to our broken constitution. I think two is the least radical. Maybe it's we have we. Yeah, we versus I. I'll go with we brought change to our broken constitution. And I remain committed to stamping out corruption that has plagued Swordish corporations for far too long. Thunderous applause is erupted. <laughs> Two is a little bit egotistical. I'll say one. Swordland has changed, but the USP remains as strong as ever. There's been tremendous progress made in this term, and there is more to come. I promise you there is no way we can lose. I've devoted an unprecedented amount of effort toward making Swordland's economy the best in the world. We will not lose. Shush, shush, Super Chacho. I and President Vectorn shall lead Swordland into a bright new future. A bright new era. A roar shook the hall. We will form a broad coalition of supporters to make sure it is time, my fellow swords, a new day is upon us, and it begins right here and right now. It's time to get back on board the rain train. <laughs> so remember, vote rain in 58. So it's about to be 1958. I feel like two is the obvious choice here, right? <laughs> Oh, the rain train is off. Awesome. Uh. <laughs> Get on the board, the rain train. All right, we'll go with two. The audience enthusiastically finished the saying as streamers shot out of the cannons behind me. My re-election campaign had officially begun. I stepped down from the podium. Well, that seemed to go well. Yeah. Briefing on the current economic situation. Well, the economy looks like it's doing pretty well. I arrived at the Ministry of the Economy and proceeded upstairs. An assistant waited by the door to, meet, to the meeting room and took my jacket. I opened the door and entered the largest boardroom in the building. Simon was sitting alone with a glass of water and his documents laid out before him. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good to see you. Likewise. He stood up when I entered and approached me. After a quick handshake, I took a seat. A knock was heard on the door and Pater entered the room. I hope I'm not late. Did you start, Mr. Vice President? No, not yet. Now that everyone's here, let's begin. As you all know, the agenda today is the e economy review for our entire term. I will brief you quickly on what we've done so far, just as a re refresher. Very well, let's go. He gathered the documents, blah, blah, blah. Our extra focus on the economy resulted in some small-scale positive growth. The extra resource allowed my department to optimize our plans as much as possible. It would be great if we follow up on this focus in the next term. Let's delve into more ingrained economic details. Please turn to page 5. I would like to say that we're on track, but I can't. Our decisions so far have been disruptive have been disruptive of our initial plan to go for a market economy. I have gone with a market economy. It looks like we're going for a mixed approach instead, something in between a market and a planned economy. We've deviated from our plan. I know. There's no need to rub it in, Simon. I'm happy to say that our trade has increased since the beginning of our term. We're on the right path. We should keep at it and maximize the potential. More trade means mo a more vibrant economy, which increases our economic development. Although an argument can be made for it, we have started to become heavily reliant on other foreign economies. Unfortunate, but one way or another, we're on this path as a result of our decisions. True, we must look ahead now.
We need to aim for a more balanced approach. We'll have to carefully consider this matter in our second term. Please turn to page 17. While trying to fix the issues with our economic system, we went for a mixed approach. We didn't hold businesses above else and also tried to answer the request of the sort of citizens. The balance is delicate and fragile. Bad news is the living standards are decreasing. We've received more and more complaints about our welfare system, which means less votes. Our opponents will use this against us. Exactly. Now to page 34. I'm confused because the economy is way better than it was when we took office. This should be more positive than this. We've lost value in terms of production rates compared to the last years. This is one of our weakest points right now. I don't understand why the game would say the economic development is like too higher than it started and everything be basically negative. We have problems in terms of logistics in our country. The infrastructure is currently lacking in quality and quantity. We need to make new roads and improve the already existing ones. There's a rightful complaints from the people and businesses. Ease of access means faster delivery and more vibrant internal economy after all. We're very close to the end. I want to talk about a few numbers. Our inflation rate is currently at an amazing 2%, down from 7%, lowest that I've seen in Swordland since the beginning of our country. Swordish rent value has been largely maintained, and the consumer prices have been stabilized. What's our debt situation? Our debt is 360 billion SR, down from 427 billion SR at the beginning of our term. We managed to bring it down quite a bit. As a result, the internal investment has increased along with our government budget. How are we doing with unemployment? Lastly, the unemployment rate is down at is at 5%, down from 16%. The change is mostly due to the investments in economic planning. What are the latest numbers on our GDP? Our GDP is at 513 billion SR, a major increase. So all of these things are positive, and yet everything he just told me before was negative? Jeez. How would I lose this election? This is like... <laughs> We're the, it's the swordish miracle. <laughs> the budget's still in the red, right? Our economy's like doubled. Take an international loan from the MFI? Do I want to take an international loan? <laughs> Everything's shit, but your economy's almost doubled. <laughs> um, I don't know about this. I feel like taking international loans while being nice for paying for your development may get us in trouble. So I'm going to do nothing comes to mind. I don't want to take a loan. And to the most important question of all, how are we doing with the recession? I see a few smiles in the room. I think we earned it. We've almost eradicated the recession in its entirety. How was everything that you were saying negative then? We achieved it. We'll go out for drinks tonight, but now that's all for our meeting. Huzzah! Okay. NFP welcomes General Lundgren's son. The National Front Party has welcomed General Lundgren's son into their midst today in Holsword. Seeing Lundgren back in politics is shocking to many citizens. General Lundgren infamously organized the military coup against former President Visky that led to the Swordish Civil War. Wait, wasn't that our diplomatic guy? Must have been like a, a relative. Uh, seeing Lundgren back in politics is shocking to many citizens. Led to the sort of civil war, Mr. Klebner has organized the event to appeal to his voter base. This is a symbolic step for the NFP as Lundgren was arguably the most well-known national nationalist in Sortland. Well, they might be plotting against us. Haas AIDS election campaign. Marcel Cornti, Haas Advertising, the biggest advertising agency in Swordland, volunteered to help with the election campaign. 
They'll provide consulting and design work for campaign material. The agency will also produce video material for television, which will be televised extensively by the channels owned by Haas Media. Haas reports that it will also be open to all party events and meetings during the campaign period. Good old corruption. Gotta love it. Amnesty given to thousands. Together with the revocation of the ban on the BFP and the subsequent amnesty, about 6,000 people who were arrested in the 1930s and 40s for their ties to the British Freedom Front have now been released. 72 high-profile Blutish political protests, protests who were being held up in maximum security and Tel Rock prison were also released. Maybe we shouldn't have released everyone, just a thought. Many of the locals in Uzerin gathered in Uzerin City Square to celebrate the revocation of the ban on the Blutish Freedom Party. The mayor of Uzerin reported that the amnesty and revocation were greeted by the Uzeneries with festivals or festivities. Blutish Freedom Party joined the election race immediately after being legalized. The BFP announced that Ramuz Kojak will be the party's presidential candidate. Their first rally will be held in Dyer tomorrow. Shouldn't you vote for me, you guys? I brought you guys out of... Out of being second-class citizens. Shouldn't you support me? All right, they're continuing to increase their presence in the Gray Strait. So they're basically putting missiles and weapon systems down here. Whole sword. So they're putting weapon systems that threaten our own capital over here. Thankfully, we're a member of the ATO, so we'll see how that helps. Um, as the 1957 election starts to approach, friends Richter and the People's Freedom and Justice Party are making ways in Lock Haven. Their campaign slogan, Victory for Everyone, covered the city under a campaign visit to the city. The PFJP has been United Sorgland's party's major opposition since the formation in the each year earning a higher percentage of the votes. Okay. Television interview. Lucien stepped or stopped me on my way out to the balcony of the Blue Mansion where the filming crew was standing ready to start filming. Are you ready for the interview, sir? Why, don't I look ready? No, sir, you look great. The crew's ready to start filming. Mr. Sacker is excited to interview you. As I explained before, it would be bad press to decline this interview offer. They're the most prestigious interview program in the world. And they th they're they from Kirut. The country is known for its neutrality. I don't think there will be too much pressure. Hope so, Lucien. I walked to the balcony and sat in the seat prepared for me directly in front of Mr. Sacker. Mr. President, welcome to One on One. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Let us begin with the latest incident between Swordland and Rumberg. An aircraft of the Swordish Air Force was shot down by Rumbergian anti-aircraft guns a few weeks ago. Officials from the Rumbergian government proclaimed that the aircraft was flying inside the airspace of Rumberg. Your government has been silent, apart from a few statements which claim that your plane was indeed in Swordish airspace when it was shot down. Do you believe the Rumbergian forces initiated an intentional attack? Well, three is a little bit much. We have reason to believe that, yes. They are being increasingly aggressive over the last years. I don't want to think they attacked us intentionally. It must have been a mistake. Two is pussy. <laughs> I'll go with one. I don't want to, like, throw down the gauntlet of declaration of war, but I do think it's clear they're being aggressive. Does that mean there will be more hostilities on the horizon? <laughs> We're part of NATO. Uh, I can't say that for sure. We'll have to ask Queen Livingston herself. Hmm. One seems a little too passive to me. We could do two or three, I feel like. Two 
Two's accusatory. Two's deflective. Uh, we'll go with two. Do you believe that these harassments could lead to an actual war between so Swordland and Rumberg in the future? I hope not. We're willing to do what it takes not to create conflict. I honestly doubt that. I believe that what Rumberg that's what Rumberg wants. We'll have to see. This week, our Kazian government has condemned Rumberg for their actions against Swordland. Now that Swordland's a member of the ATO, do you think that this would deter Rumberg from creating a broader conflict? Yes, it'll surely deter them from creating a war, but they will likely continue their harassments in other ways. That's not even a question. Queen Beatrice is not crazy to go against the whole ATO. I'm not sure. Rumberg sees itself as the third superpower of the world. We can expect anything from them. Three is some Axis and Evil shit. <laughs> like, wow, they're crazy people. Um, oh, by the way, our economy is perfect now. Just saying. <laughs> um... I guess I'll go with one. You have also earlier claimed that Rumberg's been spying on your administration, and the alleged spy was none other than your own secretary. Rumberg has since denied all your claims. We have all the evidence it was them. The world should know about Rumberg's interference in our neighbor in its neighbors. Your Boris Yeltsin strategy of intense privatization has worked. Apparently not intense enough, Super Chacho. We have all the evidence it, it was them. The world should know about Rumberg's in interference in its neighbors. Some also claim that your secretary was involved in certain dealings with your vice president, which your administration didn't want getting out, so she became the scapegoat. What do you have to say about these accusations? It's all nonsense. We have evidence she was working for Rumberg. Her real name is Ilana Vance. Don't you think you were partly to blame? She was your secretary. It was going on right under your nose. To some extent, yes. All of our administration shares the responsibility for letting such a scandal take place. Okay, let's return back to your foreign policy. Let's talk about the ongoing conflict on the Hegeland Islands. Swordland is not officially taking any sides between Angolia and Vagsland. So far, you've refrained from making any statements about the conflict. According to reports from yesterday, Vagslandian navy had finally attacked the Angolian fleet at the Hege Islands. Today, President M Prime Minister Van Horten announced that the island is indeed under an invasion. He said that Vagslandian troops landed on the island. So here's my question. What is and will be the role of Swordland in the conflict? Oh boy. Swordland has no role in this conflict. We're not taking any sides. Would Swordland get involved if the situation gets out of control? As a peacekeeping force, yes. We can't let the Mercurian Sea turn into a war zone. Oh fuck, are we Canada now? Newhauser, you would know best about that, huh? Um, God damn it. I mean, I haven't talked to my diplomatic people at all about this conflict. I 
I hope the situation won't come to that. But what if it does, Mr. President? One is interventionism. <sighs> we do need sea access, and our navy's way smaller. I guess, I mean, Arcasia could get involved, but then the entire alliance system probably falls into a into a world war. So I guess I'll go with three. Right? Three is the least offensive. We have no evidence they're actually going to try and cut off our sea access, but if we piss them off, they sure will, and their navy's way more powerful than ours. The only way it matters is if we get into, uh, you know, get into the ATO situation, but Vagsland is allied to the, to, the, to the effective of the Warsaw Pact, so three seems like the most, most ideal situation. Last year, a huge conflict took place close to your borders in Valen. When the Vesic force... By the way, I thought... Uh, didn't Lucian say this was supposed to all be softball questions? These are all fucking dynamite. When the uh, Vesic forces partook in a massacre of Blutish civilians under the guise of eliminating the Blutish Freedom Front, Swordland decided to watch the atrocities take place. In fact, you not only closed the borders to the refugees fleeing from a massacre, your border guards worked in cooperation with the Vesic forces. Will you accept responsibility for thousands of lives that were lost in Valen? God damn it. It breaks my heart to see so many people die in Valen. Could we have done something? Definitely, but the conflict has nothing to do with us. I guess I am kind of sticking with my anti-interventionism. Many have criticized Sordland for its role in the conflict. Do you not accept any of the criticisms? No, there's nothing wrong with protecting our country. Well, it seems that's all the time we have today. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you for coming to Swordland. Okay. Oh man, there's a whole lot of newspaper articles. Workers' Party announces leak is the replacement for Ejol. The Workers' Party of Blutia announced the independent MP and the previous leader of the WP and Mission Leak to be the replacement for Fida Ejol. Okay. Swordland's Darkest Hour. During Swordland's Darkest Hour, President Rain took the rain and led the country out of depression. Millions of jobs added, countless businesses opened, and a myriad of investors pouring into Swordland. Economists and foreign leaders predict Swordland to be an economic giant in the long run, while historians will engrave the great Swordish recovery to Swordland's record. Kiebner condemns President Rain. In a televised interview, Kesaro Kiebner condemned President Rain for unbanning the Blutish freedom. I don't care about you. Largest military parade ever. President Rain has announced Swordland's largest military parade ever to display strength. Blutish rights bill rejected by the assembly. Uh oh. Wait, I thought it passed. According to the speaker, only 100 lawmakers voted in favor of the amendment, failing to gain a simple majority. I'm confused. I thought... This said the Minority Act right was signed. And the BFP's been unblocked. That's got to be a glitch. Leader of the Workers' Party of Blutie is rumored to have been poisoned by a nerve agent?
Yeah, I did sign it. That's got to be a glitch. Well, I didn't poison anybody. Maggie, I don't... That doesn't make sense. If I signed... It doesn't come to me unless it's already past the house. That would make no sense for me to sign a bill before it goes to the house. Okay, so Vagsland is occupied Hilgy land. Following Rumberg's demands for reparations from Swordland, the tensions have increased dramatically between the two countries. Yesterday, Swordland's... Also, the party is unbanned because they're running for office, so they had to have passed it. The Supreme Court didn't shoot it down. It said that the House did. Also, it also said that the parties are, are campaigning, so clearly the, the bill passed. It has to be a glitch in the game. Okay. Unrest is rampant and dire. The Bluish citizens have faced oppression on par with President Sol's government. Bluish activists and dire are calling for President Reign's resignation. I literally signed a law into getting you guys freedom. Following a visit to Lock Haven, the president spent the afternoon meeting with taking photos of citizens. The patriotism was unexpected, but it was clear the citizens were delighted to witness their president in person. Okay. So, not popular in Bergia, popular in Lock Haven. Never should have given their, their freedom. Maybe. Read the report from Whole Sword. Okay, we already saw that. Early morning at the Rain household. As usual, I woke up early in the morning. I put on my clothes and went downstairs. I made a cup of finely ground swordish coffee um, along with a slice of buttered toast and sat down in front of the TV to watch the morning news. I changed the channel to the SBC and took a bite of my toast. I'm curious to see what President's response will be. For those who are tuning in late, today is certainly going to be a rough day for the administration. We have confirmation about the certainty of these leaks. This is nothing short of a major scandal that could very well, well lead to the impeachment of President Rain. What? As per recent information, we've reviewed President Rain's name as mentioned many times in these leaks, according to these documents. As part of the privatization process, President Rain sold shares in a backroom deal to Marcel Cornty. Oh, God damn it! We've been trying to reach out to the Maroon Palace about these allegations and scandals. However, we've been unable to reach anyone yet. Flip the table? Ha! Throw the remote at the TV. Turn the TV off. <laughs> uh, I think I'll just turn the TV off. Yes, I did. I did, Newhauser. That was the most corrupt thing I've done so far. The historic Graff Manor lay on the outskirts of Avery at the end of a long, winding drive. Nearly two centuries old, it was as formidable as Leal's herself. Leal's invited me to for, from a private dinner, just the two of us. Leal's is totally the one who stabbed me in the back. I do not trust Leal's. Gas lanterns lent, uh, okay, Leals was sitting on the sofa. Above her hung a nearly life-size portrait of a sallow, unhappy-looking young woman in a lace ball gown. Is that you? Is that your mother? Is that your grandmother? How am I supposed to know? Probably weird if she had a portrait of herself, right? Yeah. 
Maybe grandmother? Damn it! The silver lining is that despite personally despising me, they felt compelled to grant me all the advantages a son would have had, including the education I needed to rise to my current position. Given how your wife spends her time these days, I thought you might be in need of a home-cooked supper. Uh-oh. Eh, speaking of which... She led me into the dining room with a glittering chandelier hung from the high ceiling. Beneath it was a long table set for two, a woman in an apron and a chef's hat. Vasek, by her appearance, ceremoniously presented a roasted a roast rack of venison. Smells delicious. The groundkeeper shot it this morning. Okay, you frickin' aristocrat. Anton, I want you to know that I have nothing but respect for you. But given certain developments that have occurred over the course of your term, I believe you are no longer fit to lead the United Swordland Party. I want you to be the first to know that I myself will be running against you as, at the Party Congress. What do you mean, unfit? Don't play dumb with me. Did you think I'd sit by as you made a mockery out of this country's constitution? The very constitution that's keeping this nation safe from internal and external threats? You're a disgrace to the good name of Tarkin's soul. Should I try and bribe her? I probably don't have enough money for that. Did you poison my food? <laughs> so I have three very abrupt options. One, I can threaten to, I can offer to bribe her. Two, I can uh, ask her if she poisoned my food. And one, I can fire her. Well, trying to bribe her will probably not uh, result in anything positive. She's already rich. And uh, she also is not happy with the direction the country is going. And she could be president if... So I think probably one, one you're fired, right? I want you to give time to con I want to give you time to consider backing me. Sorry, Lils. I can't back down now. <laughs> I understand why you never found a husband. May the best man win. Well, she's a woman, so that would probably be... I will be tactful. It's a shame to lose you. Well, that's great. So, Leels is now running against me. New fighter jets, all right. Seabass, thanks for the follow. Military parade. It was an unusual day for the residents of Holesword. Regularly, regularly used streets and avenues were blocked off by the military personnel. Many shops and cafes were closed, and once crowded stores were now empty. Instead, thousands of residents in Holesword were concentrated in one street, Victory Avenue. Stretching out through the heart of whole sword, people on both sides of the road were waving their swordish flags, pr flags proudly from the, for the military parade. I was getting prepared to embark on my trip. I, it was getting to be a short drive down the Victory Avenue until we reached the Maroon Palace. My company for this trip was Yosef and S Serge, as usual, driving the presidential car. Yosef approached me. He was wearing his decorated ceremony outfit. He carried a sword with a goat head at the hat handle and his pistol by his hip. He put on his cap. Mr. President, we're almost ready. We will depart right after the tank column. Rumberg will think twice after today. 
They will tremble before the swordish, swordish military might. After hearing the loud thump of a book falling down to the floor, he turned to a couple of privates that were doing preparations on the schedule and started walking in the direction. Private, can't you do your job properly? What is this salute, soldier? Watch, this is a real salute. Strict as ever. Old habits die hard. Mr. President, Mr. Lankia. Serge performed a salute to Yosef, which made Yosef smile under his mustache. At ease, Mr. Volkner. Are we ready to, de to, de to depart yet? Yes, sir. Follow me, please. Mr. President, have you seen the tanks? Our planes, too. Rumberg will, so be, will be so scared when they see this. God, he's so annoying. Oh, wait, this is Serge. I thought this was Yosef. That's the plan. My kids were very excited to wake up today, you know, to see the planes fly. Morna, 7th Artillery Squadron. I still talk with many of my friends from those days. Camaraderie of the military is never forgotten. I still talk with many from my days as well. You're, you're still sort of in it, but... Who can forget about Major Lankia? We called him the Relentless. Good old days. We're here, sir. We exited the building and walked out over to the clearance where the black, uh, where the black halada, the presidential car, was waiting. It was decorated properly for the event, and and the top canopy had been removed so that we could stand and wave to the people. Oh boy, grassy knoll coming. <laughs> uh, who's ready for grassy knoll? I'm gonna get shot. On the way to the car, generals and admirals were lined up on both sides of the carpet. The atmosphere immediately changed when the experienced men who fought many times for their country saluted me. I saluted back with respect. I saluted the high-ranking military staff and attachés from ATO. We stood and shook hands before proceeding. We entered the car and Serge started the engine. Yosef was standing right next to me. The car started rolling. Even though there were many walls and trees between the car and the crowd, I was able to hear the deafening sounds of cheering swordish citizens. Gradually, we made our way to the starting point. A group of 10, maybe 12 latest technology S-16 fighter jets flew above our heads, and I thought that the engine sounds were going to leave me deaf. Loud footsteps of the marching soldiers were followed by loud noises coming from the tank engines. The tank came into view. They were not the most modern models, however. They displayed our military might. I couldn't even finish my thought as one of the tanks broke down and had to be towed. Maybe I should have modernized the tanks, not the Air Force. We waited for a few minutes for the announcement. Finally, it was our turn. On both sides of the Victory Avenue, we were, were, there were numerous citizens cheering my name, waving their swordish flags. Wave. Looking at the benches, there were the general staff uh, was sitting at. I saw Tarkin Sol sitting next to General Valken. From this distance, it was hard to tell, but he tipped his hat off to me, and I could swear that he was smiling. We kept our slow and steady pace. We were almost at Artur S. Whiskey statue, several hundred meters away. A group of so soldiers saluted me as we passed by. They looked proud and stout in the new un infantry uniforms with brand new rifles. I'm curious how the description of this situation would be different if we hadn't increased our funding of the military. I guess I'm not going to get shot. Okay. What's the news say? Minister of Interior Graf resigns. Media was bought by Rain. Great. The lies of Rain. Graf throws in the towel. Well, this scandal is going to come back to bite me now, isn't it? I'm, yeah. Will of the state. I'm a little worried that Lyles is going to get the conservatives to turn on me. I've been probably less, I've been, I've been hedging between the different parties and that's probably not the best strategy if I don't have my unified party behind me. All right, everybody, this is going to be the end of this episode. Uh, we dealt with a power struggle within our own party. 
and in our next episode we will finish up the game of suzerain uh, and hopefully win our re-election as we attempt to lead suzerain into a bright new day but until next time this is the historical gamer saying once again thank you very much for watching and until next time i'm out <laughs>